acabar y empiezo yo a acabar. Welcome to today's webinar organized by the Society of Spanish Researchers and the Embassy of Spain in South Africa. My name is Ainara Mancebo, Deputy President of the Society of Spanish Researchers in South Africa. I'm glad to chair and welcome today's speaker, Dr. Carmen Martinez Vargas. Before we start, the Ambassador of Spain, Don Carlos Enrique Fernandez Arias Minuesa, will introduce today's webinar. At the end of the presentation, we would love to hear from you and we will open question time. Likewise, you could use uh, the, the Zoom chat to write your questions for answering at the end of the presentation. Good day and welcome to the fourth 2021 webinar organized by the Embassy of Spain in Pretoria together with the Society of Spanish Researchers in South Africa. Under the title, Epistemic Governments and Epistemic Humility in Higher Education, today's webinar is given by Dr. Carmen Martinez Vargas, who is Doctoral Research Fellow of the Higher Education and Human Development Research Group of the University of the Free State. Dr. Martinez Vargas will present on this webinar a Southern Evaluative and Perspective Comprehension of Epistemic Governance. Dr. Martinez Vargas has more than six years experience working with participatory approaches within the Global North and the Global South, having collaborated in more than six national and international research projects. I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. I'm just gonna share my screen. There we go. Um, can you see the PowerPoint? I just wanna make sure. Yes, all good, perfect. Ready to go. Um, thank you very much everyone for being here today. Um, I just wanna make some um, clarifications about the presentation just before going ahead. Uh, with the different uh, themes that I'm going to be exploring. And um, the first is to mention that uh, when Alvaro contacted me for um, this presentation, I was obviously thinking what will be more of interest for this kind of collective. And I thought that uh, more than presenting a more specific kind of project uh, focused on my area of ex expertise, it will be um, kind of helpful to bring a more theoretical and more global debate that can include from different disciplines and then discuss um, towards the end. So that's why today I'm presenting this paper, Epistemic Governance and Epistemic Humility in Higher Education. Um, this is a paper um, that is actually published. Um, I will share later on uh, all the information for you in, in case you want to read it. Um, but it was a paper uh, from an invitation uh, from, the, um, uh, from a journal for a special issue. And I grabbed this paper from the head of my department, Professor Melanie Walker. So um, it was published last year. Um, but as I said, I thought it will be really relevant um, to have a debate um, as an academic community and an epistemic community of uh, Spanish people based in South Africa. And especially, I think it's quite um, generative because of the discussion between Global South and Global North, as um, many of us, you know, might consider ourselves somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in between as being a Spanish people, but um, at the same time based in, in South Africa. So I thought this paper will be really uh, powerful to really talk critically about our role as researchers in this global network of epistemic relations that is academia. Um, so let me go with the next one, there we go. So what I'm gonna do is to start um, contextualizing epistemic governance, uh, what it is. Then I will go to uh, what uh, we know about the literature on epistemic governance so far and what is missing. 
uh, to propose an epistemic governance um, analysis from a soft term perspective. So after that, I will go to explore um, the epistemic structure of different higher education institutions and how they are connected in these um, relationships. And um, to conclude, I will um, present the agency-centric perspective of epistemic governance that we presented in the paper. So I just wanted to keep in mind that I'm talking from the field of development studies. Uh, my specialization is in development studies and higher education. So it's some, somewhere in between and multidisciplinary. Um, however, this paper is really focused on the role of different higher education as epistemic agents in the system, um, but contextualized in the space of development studies. So you will see that when I refer to the literature, it will focus mo mostly on, on that um, area. Um, but of course, you know, this uh, brings all the potential to, to bring it to other scientific areas and see whether or not um, these other scientific areas also um, have diff the same kind of issues and challenges when, when we talk about them and their connection among themselves. Um, so um, I would like to start um, talking about what I mean by Global South, um, because this is a highly debated um, aspect uh, before I go to epistemic, what is epistemic governance? And when I'm talking in, the, in, the, in this talk about um, Global South, what I mean is not necessarily a geographical space, but more a geopolitical space in the way that the Sosa Santos explained it. So what he meant is that basically we can have Global North in the South and we can have Global South in the North. So it's more like an ontological and epistemological position more than just the geographical. So I think this is especially important when we talk in the area of development studies uh, because of all the relations that we found between uh, Global South and Global North and the power asymmetries that are found in between. Uh, but we can talk about that or discuss this aspect later on if, if you feel like expanding this. So uh, what do I mean by epistemic governance or what do we know as well of epistemic governance? So um, Campbell and Karajanis um, define epistemic governance or refer to it as the epistemic structure and knowledge paradigms that underline higher education. Um, and what that um, explains that referred to power relations in creating knowledge about socioecological issues with particular reference to the interrelation of policymaking and scientific knowledge. So usually when we talk about epistemic governance in the literature, we see that there is a, um, a structural focus on organizations, institutions and systems. But there are also kind of ethical and moral understandings of what um, epistemic governance ought to be, or um, we expect them, uh, we expect, it, expect to do. So Campbell and Karajanis um, explained that good, effective and sustainable higher education is not possible when the underlying epistemic structure and knowledge paradigms of higher education are not addressed. So they're in the epistemic governance of, of these structures. So what happened in the literature then is that we can see that there is a kind of limited uh, critical analysis of the epistemic structure and what it is, the ep epistemic governance between them. And uh, we talk about this in a kind of more centric analysis in the sense that um, it, it ignores the um, uneven, playing, the uneven playing field in knowledge production in terms of North and South, uh, because most of the time these structural analysis are just um, connections and not necessarily power analysis, but also it says really little about what individuals in institutions can or cannot do 
overlooking the potential of agentic practices in preserving and promoting epistemic freedoms. So what we do, um, Melanie Walker and I in this paper, is that we try to propose an epistemic governance from a South term perspective that do not focus necessarily only on structures, but that it does combine structures and agents as um, principal elements of our analysis to actually make evaluative assessments of how well uh, we are doing in terms of or epistemic, global epistemic structure. So to do that, um, what we do is to, um, in a way, get a normative positionality in all this field. And then we uh, bring the centrality of epistemic injustices in relation to the colonial epistemic system. So to do that, what we use is, first of all, Freaker, Amanda Freaker, well known for um, her work in epistemic injustices, but also the expansion of her work by Gotzi in terms of hermeneutic obstruction. So what we do is to say, well, in order to assess how well we're doing as epistemic um, um, structures, and epistemic governance, we need to pay attention to epistemic injustices. And these epistemic injustices can be divided among testimonial and hermeneutical epistemic injustices as Fricker highlighted. So when Fricker is referring to hermeneutical, what we're <clears throat> talking about is a, a more kind of a structural um, oppression uh, epistemic oppression. So it's more at the level of participation in the generation of social meaning. When we're talking about testimonial epistemic injustices, we are referring more to a one-on-one -on -one kind of relation. So uh, she uses the case of someone that is, um, um, that is um, participating um, in a conversation and actually is being um, judged and um, um, is okay. So her uh, the person credibility is somehow harmed by the prejudice of the listen listeners or the hearers of the conversation. So for instance, here we can say that if we're having a conversation with a group of people about uh, feminism and then the other uh, people refuse or um, kind of uh, diminish your credibility for being a feminist, this will be what a testimonial kind of injustice will be. So what happened is even if freakers make the differences between hermeneutical and testimonial, we believe and we argue in this paper that they work together because we believe that many testimonials are rooted in hermeneutical injustices. Um, but we also found Gotzi clarification about hermeneutic, hermeneutic obstruction quite um, enlightening um, because um, what Gotzi does is criticize the hermeneutical conceptualization of Fricker. And then he um, divides different kind of um, hermeneutic um, injustices that can be fit within this hermeneutical um, epistemic injustice. So he used the hermeneutic obstruction um, to um, explain when the subject, her own social group, and at least some social groups to which she does not belong, all have the required interpretative tools to make her experience intelligible, but there remain some who have not yet acquired them, and so those interpretative tools fail to pass into the collective resource. So I think this is um, kind of interesting, especially in terms of uh, racism, sexism, and what we see in the epistemic governance system, um, because this is basically when um, we all know that we have a, um, a structural racism in many societies and many people do have the epistemic tools to understand that oppression, like um, Black Lives Matters in America. But for instance, the judicial system is refusing to acknowledge in certain cases, right? So even if the society in itself has the interpretative tools to understand that oppression, that oppression is minimized or ignored because some of the 
um, some of the groups of that society do not want to understand or ignore it, even if they have the tools to learn how that oppression occurs in a school. And I mean, in societies such as um, uh, the US or the UK, uh, we cannot argue that it's not because they don't have availability of the interpretative tools they need to understand that oppression. So, um, so our way to move forward after identifying these epistemic injustices is therefore to use the capability approach as a normative framework. So what we are arguing in this paper is not um, is, is a way of what we think epistemic governance ought to be and what we need to take as a reference, as a valuative reference in order um, to move forward and not backwards. Um, so in the capability approach, um, um, well, the capability approach is conceptualized by Martinson, but also we have many other scholars involved on it, like Nussman. Um, but it's true that uh, we focus here on Martinson's concepts and ideas um, because his open-ended um, understanding of the capability approach is really generative for this um, case. So we see that um, at the center of the capability approach are capabilities that are uh, real freedoms, like the freedoms that someone has available, but not only available, but they have reason to value. And this is quite important because Amartya Sen gives uh, the centrality of public scrutiny and democracy uh, to the capability approach. And that's why uh, the reason to value is central in the approach in the sense that we're not talking about the dominant groups, but the dominant group do have reason to value which freedoms, but rather which freedoms are important for different societies and for different times in history and how we can connect with each other to understand which freedoms are important and we need to protect. So it's an evaluative framework that allow us to see um, which freedoms we need to protect and which um, freedoms are being experienced and we need to somehow remove and promote the freedoms. Um, so in this, in, this, in this framework, we also have the idea of agency. And the idea of agency is obviously linked to this uh, fundamental freedom. So, here we will see the agent as someone that is um, not following or coerced by any uh, person, but rather a person that acts in its um, her own will um, to do the things that she has risen to value, according to the cultural values, according to the local values um, and the local cosmovisions and ontologies. And therefore, because of this perspective, what Amartya Sen comes up with is the idea of um, social justice. So what Amartya Sen does is not to create a theory of justice as um, Namarta Nussman does, but rather um, he leaves it open. So um, social justice is about promoting the freedoms that different people have reason to value. So even if Amartya Sen talks about central freedoms that we can talk about, um, what, I, what we believe is important for this talk is, is to have that idea that uh, freedoms are central as well, not only as evaluative framework, but as evaluative framework to advance towards social justice. So in this um, area, what we do is to use the Lovogatseni um, idea of epistemic freedoms. And we think that um, he is, um, as says, well, he basically said that epistemic, the epistemic freedoms of Africa are just critical in order to overcome other uh, and freedoms in Africa. So that's why he said no African futures without epistemic freedom to nurture the necessary critical decolonial consciousness to theorize and interpret the world and, and, and encumber it by Eurocentrism, as he put it, seek epistemic freedom first. So what Endelovo Gatsumi is saying is like epistemic freedoms are architectonic freedoms in order to become dignified um, uh, um, agents and dignified humans being in, in society. 
And then uh, we take the idea of epistemic humility because um, Gotzi is playing that to resolve these epistemic oppressions and hermeneutical oppressions, what aliens require is admitting the gaps in one own interpretative tools, especially with respect to the experiences uh, the experience of the marginally situated. And this is central to the paper because what we argue is that um, all is something related to kind of the colonial literature and um, um, the Sosa Santos explained it, explained it well in the sense that every epistemic system is limited as its position in a way. So what we do require is this kind of epistemic humility that allow us to connect different epistemic system with their own interpretative gaps um, that allow us right, to, to move forward together and not um, divide it. Um, but of course, this has to come with this humility of accepting um, that you need other, others' interpretative tools uh, to overcome that gap. Um, so that will be what epistemic humility is. And of course, for this short term perspective, what is necessary is this dimension of Ubuntu in the terms of highlighting uh, the agents, agents and collective responsibility with others that we think basically is missing in the epistemic governance literature. So it's bringing all these elements together, but with a sense, with the ethical stand in which we claim responsibility and admitting our own limitations within the structure and as aliens. So um, now what, what I'm gonna go is to go through what we call the colonial epistemic structure, which is how the structure of epistemic, um, um, epistemic elements are connected and how this um, hermeneutical uh, oppression is actually uh, happening in real life. So I'm going to bring real examples of how um, this is happening. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, I'm going to focus on development studies. So we see that if we talk generally, um, many authors have claimed that development works to maintain and not necessarily dismantle global structures of dependency, including knowledge systems. But Tikli also remind us that development can be understood today as the new kind of imperialism that's, that is assertively European and Eurocentric, a central organizing principle of the entire Western episteme hence of the colonial epistemic structure. So we see how development studies that's supposed to be that of advancing um, a plural ground in which we can all develop a different and plural and diverse societies is it might not be doing that, but actually doing the, the opposite. And I hope I, I demonstrate this through all the examples that I'm gonna give uh, today. So in terms of collaborations, research collaboration between the North and the South, we see the most striking example is what we call the glorified field workers. So what we see is that collaboration masks uh, many epistemic problems, even exacerbate them, uh, noting how frequently African scientists role is limited to providing samples and conducting Fill work. So what happened is that instead of allowing the global south to theorize from the global south, the materials are collected and then the theoretical work is done from the north. And this not only have uh, consequences for the um, instrumental uh, nature of these collaborations as bringing the glorified field workers um, in Africa as Jewish field workers, but also in the way that we produce knowledge and how we theorize about that um, data. Um, of course, what happened with all this is that we create this kind of boss employee relationship. So there is little acknowledgement of the value on, and the importance of the work that is done, but also the difficulties in accessing certain fields and collecting reliable data, which is kind of important because we see many times that even if um, there are um, clear collaborations, 
many African scholars might not be um, co-authors in, in papers, even if they have been collecting this data and have a central role in accessing some really difficult context. In terms of mobilities, it's, it's kind of interesting, and I'm quite sure many of you might have uh, examples in your department. I do personally in mine, but this is a case uh, brought by O'Malley. Um, the author was explaining how a group of, of African researchers were prevented from participating in a workshop in the UK because Home Office said that on the balance of, of probabilities, we do not believe you are a researcher. And we know how um, this happened often, and especially um, when you're in places like South Africa working with international teams. And we see as well that when invitations come to the Global South and Global South researchers, they have to respond many times and most of the cases to no-term epistemic priorities. And they seem instrumental to preset research agendas. So how many times is just a, the fact that they need partners in the Global South for that kind of grant and they use instrumentally use uh, Global South researchers just to tick the the, the aspects that they need to overcome or you need, they need to cover, sorry. So um, of course, invitations are just judged to be tokenistic because funders require the participation of researchers from particular regions or the, or the North-South relationship is since as unchanged in that the North has the money and tries to dictate the research agenda and African are continually having to respond to someone else's agenda. So I will expand on this point later on when we talk about grants, but basically we see how uh, this instrumentalization, not only as field workers, but also as partners, is something uh, normal in, within the field of development studies. So when we go to the uh, publication aspect, we see that there is a dominance of UK and USA authors in development studies journals. So obviously we will expect that in development studies journals, we will see more Southern authors than Northern authors, as uh, usually development journals will deal with many issues experienced in the global South and not necessarily in the global North. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not the case. So what we see is that less than 3% of such journals included authors in the Global South, which is a striking, less than 3%. But equally, African scholars are underrepresented and or marginalized by the main global knowledge production centers, such as top tier journals or key international conferences. So it's not only, of course, about the marginalization of the field workers that might um, cause that an African scholar is not part of a co-author paper, but it's as well that um, they are most of the time underrepresented and in, in, tip, in top tier journals, so the for the powerful conversations in the field, but also key international conferences in which all the debates are generated and therefore the agendas are put forward from, from them. So, um, so then if we follow the money, <laughs> we find epistemic injustice. And um, as I was mentioned uh, before, um, the fact that the Global North uh, possess or their easy access to grants for research, it does make a huge difference. And it does produce many epistemic inequalities in regarding to uh, Global South researchers. So we see how donors uh, reproduce dependencies and constrain local decision making. And therefore, you know, a decolonial analysis can help in interrogating the epistemic power of global donors. And we believe this is about their good intentions, right? Their versions of development and the discourse of the internationalization of higher education as an unequivocal good, 
who decides and whose agenda, which is quite important. So, um, but equally what we see is that these inequalities are equally reproduced at the national level. So we see in the global south, and I think this example is pretty, is talking a lot to the South African context. It's like we have one or two leading universities that are favor partners of the north, while the others are overlooked. And as I said, we can see this clearly as um, historically advantage and historically disadvantage and how certain historically advantage uh, might be the ones that are more in connection with these grants and um, are allowed to enter this kind of conversations more than the others. So what we see and what we found valuable is that for Southern researchers, um, is not only um, because many times Southern researchers are seen as not having the interpretative tools to participate in, um, in important and powerful discussions, knowledge uh, discussions, uh, because they are considered um, not to have those kind of skills or those kind of um, that kind of language, uh, scientific language and so on. We can, we can debate about this later on. But what we are overseeing and what the Global North is ignoring is that Southern researchers are exposed to everyday inequality and produce new knowledge and innovative ways of thinking out of the interaction of their lived material context of development and high degrees of poverty and inequality. So what I mean here is that Southern researchers are living in this context. They are living every single day with these inequalities and their way of thinking is intrinsically different to a Northern researcher. And that is not taken into consideration when collaborations come and they are just the glorified field workers. So, and we also believe that it has been really problematic, the silence about conditions of racism in development studies and how it produces inequality within contemporary um, development studies in, in this field and between researchers, um, including education and international development. So then I guess my questions are, can we university-based researchers reject the financial lures of global funding programs? Can North and Southern researchers engage in collaborative research despite the unfair epistemic structures in place? What will equal and fair research partnership look like promoting epistemic freedoms for all and not for few? which epistemic communities get to decide the research fuzzy and the research questions, which epistemic organizations get to decide which projects are funded and which are not, who gets to be the principal investigator to participate and to decide, and who as a North-based agent standing with others is willing to stand up and question these decisions. So then um, in a way to answer these questions and not, um, our intention wasn't to provide a close um, uh, perspective, but rather an open-ended and a um, proposal of what we can do with all these inequalities and how we analyze the epistemic governance structure in a way that allow us to capture this complexity is to move us towards what we call an agency-centric perspective of epistemic governance with epistemic humility. So we propose an agency-centered perspective to assist us towards a better evaluative space on how epistemic governance regimes are currently doing, but also how they can improve prospectively. So it's not only an evaluative framework, but also a perspective, how we can improve this um, towards, towards more um, just relationship rather than less. So um, for that, we need to evaluate our own research practices and or institutions, both agency and a structure, 
in relation to whether or not people's epistemic agency is respected and people's epistemic freedoms expanded. As we were seeing before, because epistemic freedoms are fundamental to become a dignified human being that belongs to a, a particular society. So to do this, we are not talking about epistemic charity, you know, which is what we observe many of the times. But although this can be well-meaning, what we are advocating is for relations of solidarity and not false generosity and charity. So a fair epistemic governance system from a Southern capabilities perspective will entail the real opportunities that scholars in the South have to contribute to knowledge paradigms and epistemic materials as knowers beyond the Western epistemic system in a global community of scholars. So this exactly represent that combination between agency and a structure in which South scholars need to contribute to knowledge. And this knowledge do not need to be a Western part of a Western epistemic system, although it can be, but rather be from a Western epistemic system, but also from other epistemic system in a global community of scholars. So in the hegemonic system. It will require agency on the part of northern scholars to examine coloniality and their own location, their cognitive assumptions and their communicative practice and actively to seek out, hear and act in solidarity with Southern hermeneutical descent. So here, what we are saying is like, is not only um, protecting and paying attention to the structures that are oppressing Global South scholars, but rather as well a reflection from Northern scholars to examine their own positionalities in these networks of power um, to actually enhance the freedoms of Southern scholars when they are trying to dissent, right? When they are trying to enter the dominant discourses. So Northern researchers need to change their own epistemologies of ignorance their assumptions that we all enjoy the same level of epistemic freedoms and their complicity in producing hermeneutic obstructions. Hence, epistemic humility on the part of aliens, which require admitting the gaps in one's own interpretative tools, especially with respect to the experience of the marginally situated. So exactly what I was mentioning before about epistemic humility, recognizing that even if we are Global North researchers, we are not, um, it's impossible for, our, for us to advance if we are not taking into consideration other epistemic systems because even or, um, epistemic system do have um, gaps in our own interpretative tools. So we believe that Kelleher um, uh, make a really interesting proposal uh, to create this kind of um, global north reflection of aliens uh, with the idea of personal or integral ethics. So she understands um, personal or integral ethics as a personal ethics grounded in recognizing that each of us must deliberately consider our particular actions and how we integrate our choices made in various spheres into the personal context of our individual lives. So this will be connecting and creating a personal responsibility towards the epistemic freedoms of others. And this include not only other Global North researchers, but Global South researchers. So for us, epistemic governance is grounded in epistemic justice. And this is the only way that we can advance ethical agential skills in relation to research thereby removing the barriers and opening up a wider range of options from which people can choose. So what matters is, as we were mentioning before about the idea of Ubuntu, is not only our own epistemic freedoms and agency, but that of others, because we become persons through other persons and cannot develop full personhood absent the development of the freedoms and agency of others. So collective responsibility towards all those situated on the wrong side of the epistemic line, which is what 
um, and the love of Gatsani uh, mentioned in, in his book. Thank you very much. Um, this is the paper um, that is published, as I said, as part of a special issue in critical studies in education. And um, yeah, the title of the paper is Epistemic Governance and the Colonial Epistemic Structure Towards Epistemic Humility and Transform South-North um, Relations. So, so yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. There you have um, yeah, my email as well, in case you wanna keep in contact. Thank you very much, Dr. Carmen Martinez Vargas, for this uh, interesting and fantastic presentation. I think now we are going to use the last minutes to open question time. Um, Leah will have one question I would like to ask you uh, about uh, your uh, epistemic uh, governance. How applying your colonial epistemic governance? How do you see the research collaboration during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? That's an interesting uh, question. <laughs> I probably haven't thought about it, uh, but, but I think it's a, it's a good point to, to start thinking. Um, I actually think that the, the pandemic brought uh, a really interesting tool to our lives and is connecting without needing a lot of resources as we did before. Um, because um, you know that in order to be um, part of the hegemonic conversations, we need to go annually to international conference that are involve a lot of cost in, um, in planes and accommodation. And especially, you know, Global South uh, researchers, it's, it's not so easy to be part of this because of financial constraints, because um, the the rent is not always the same compared to Europe's so or dollars. And uh, for us, it costs much more than, than for Global North researchers to move to a conference in Africa or in, in, in Latin America. Um, so I think the pandemic opened up the um, virtual um, an online space that wasn't available before, because even if some conferences were um, already introducing some kind of hybrid um, systems already before the pandemic, it wasn't the norm. The norm was attending face-to-face. -face. So I believe that space, that uh, virtual space has been really important for many uh, scholars that otherwise they will not have been able to attend these discussions and conversations. So I think it has allowed um, uh, and a space there. But of course, we have to keep in mind also the limitations of internet, the limitations of resources. And I'm not thinking here just in the South African context, which we might think that most of the academics will have um, an internet connection and um, a laptop to connect, but rather other places in the global south that might not be so easy, other countries in, in the continent of Africa. So I think even if, um, we had that space, we also need to recognize the potential limitations in terms of um, internet connection, but also the, um, the resources to pay a really expensive uh, internet connection. And we know that video um, is kind of um, uh, consuming a lot of data, so it will, it will increase the cost of it. Um, in terms of publication, journals and collaborations, I think this has been uh, great for donors, because now they don't need to invest on uh, mobility between uh, partners, um, as had happened with development studies, because in the development studies field, I will talk about specifically relations between the UK and South Africa. We will see that uh, UK, you know, an institution in UK got the big grant, they distribute with the different partners and the UK partners are the one moving up and down to the different other countries, right? Where the data is collected. So what happened now with the grants is like now the grants do not need to cover travel accommodation. So actually it has been really, um, beneficial in terms of finances and, and grants, and of course, um, reducing the mobility. But I think the other hand, the other aspect of it is that at the end, um, not being, being in this virtual space 24 hours, seven days a week, um, and with no mobility in between, it creates um, 
more problems in terms of the workload um, in the global north and in the global south because we are requested to attend meetings when they are in US time but we are requested to continue our work locally so this um, this this contextualization of uh, working in a global community might affect global south researchers more than global north um, in terms of the workload and and so on I think I will, I will say that uh, but of course, you know, this is a whole uh, thing that need a lot of research and need a lot of careful exploration so we can better understand how these relations work. But I mean, we have seen with the vaccine, right? Um, like at the end, um, conditions of um, um, limited conditions because of the pandemic will always affect more uh, global South countries than global North. Thank you so much. We have another question here. We have, uh, could you establish a relation with other post-colonial societies, mainly in South Africa or Hispanic American countries? Yeah, um, thank you for, for that question. That, that's great. And I loved you you asked that question because I'm, I'm quite familiar with the Latin American context and all the post-colonial, decolonial literature. Um, and I think I really enjoy um, when, when I am able to see the different contexts, because of course, even if some debates, uh, we can draw a line, um, there is big, huge differences between different post-colonial contexts. Um, so of course here, what we were trying is to make this kind of a structural agentic conversation. And the paper, it was mostly directed to a global north uh, audience uh, for reflection and, and to think about um, you know, the epistemic freedoms of others, not only uh, of us. Um, but it's true that um, there are huge differences between um, post-colonial context, not only Latin America, but also in Asia. I'm not really... Um, I don't know a lot about the Asian context, but it's true that between differences in, in, in the African continent and Latin America, I'm quite familiar. And it's kind of interesting in terms of epistemic communities, I will say that um, Latin America um, has has a different historical process than the African continent. And this is seen with, um, with the resistances um, that has been against the colonial uh, dominant hegemony. So what we see in Africa is, is there, there is a strong um, um, aspiration to um, in a way belong. And I guess I don't wanna essentialize or generalize in Africa because I think Africa is really diverse. So I, I will talk much from the South African context. So what happened is that um, I think because, for instance, in the South African context, the upper head uh, time and later, um, the aim of belonging and um, uh, being part because of that for separation, it brings the South African context to a different aspiration and a different development aim, if that makes sense, than many other societies in the Latin American continent. So we see that Mexico, Colombia, Peru, um, they had historic um, historical process uh, of decolonization longer than, for instance, South Africa. And this is it's completely different. So what happened is even if they have a dominant society, which is Western, if we can call that way, um, they still have a lot of um, 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 indigenous and local communities that were uh, from the decolonization process really strong about their ontologies and cosmologies. And they have seen themselves as opposite to this Western. So even if we found that in the African context that we do, I think because of the decolonization process happened in Latin America before and in other conditions, they were able to, um, to become that alternity as, as they call themselves, as, as the possibility of being other than the Western standard. So, um, and a, a clear example is the Zapatistas movement um, in Mexico. Well, not movement, is a <laughs> more than a movement. Um, and we see how um, they have created um, societies that are 
position at the margins of what they consider a destructive uh, way of living, right? But we also see with um, um, in Peru, Bolivia, as well with ideas of el buen vivir, um, which also um, preserves, you know, local languages, local communities, and they even have um, the indigenous um, higher education system is a, is a network of um, higher education institutions that are all, all based from local um, indigenous communities that connected one to another as an alternative to um, uh, normal or uh, conventional higher education systems. So I, I think it's, it's a really interesting, uh, they are both really interesting context. And I think um, in my view, it seems that um, we're kind of uh, perhaps romanticizing um, um, like the indigenous way as the perfect, um, but we have to have in, into mind that every society, every community has limitation in itself. And I think what is needed is that conversation. So it's not, for me, it doesn't look like, um, you know, different societies do have different aims. And I was talking, um, as I was referring to the capability approach. So developments will be promoting what they, the, the societies and the individuals within the societies have reason to value. And having reason to value, are, it's, it's gonna be different in different contexts and different post-colonial contexts. Now the point is, instead of marginalizing these projects, these societal projects that are at the margins as we are doing currently in Western thinking, rather connect them in ways that we can um, expand our knowledge about ways of living better, if that makes sense, for each other. So um, what happened is because of the a severe individualism of uh, Eurocentric living, we are not yet um, in the point of connecting conversations um, in a south-south, north-south, uh, real democratic space, if that makes sense, because the hegemony is still really, um, really strong and really powerful. Um, I'm not sure if um, I answer uh, your question, but yeah, feel free to... Yeah. I think uh, you asked me perfectly and wonderful. Thank you so much uh, again, Dr. Carmen Martinez Vargas, for answering these questions and for the great presentation. And this concludes the webinar. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, remember, you could watch, you could share this webinar in our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Thank you.